This is Bible Academy. Today we continue a survey of the Old Testament looking at the subject of Hebrew poetry and wisdom. Give us some background for some books that are coming forth. Now before we begin, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege, the opportunity, and everything you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive this. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps I should apologize at the beginning of this video because I will probably make numerous mistakes. Uh, this is another retake you're looking at here. Uh, there are a number of words here I haven't pronounced for years. And uh, when I come across them again, I, I have to hesitate or pronounce it wrong a couple of times, and you're probably getting used to that anyway. Well, let's begin by the introduction, the poetry, and poetic books. About one-third of the Hebrew Old Testament is poetry. There are poetic books and poetic sections within books. These sections within non-poetic books can be as short as one or two verses, Genesis 4, 23 and 24 is a two verse one, Numbers 21, 18 is a one verse one. Longer ones include songs, hymns, or oracles, Genesis 49, two through 27, Exodus 15, one through 18, 1 Samuel 2, one through 10. There's also long oracular prose like Isaiah 40, through 66. Oracular pose, prose combines prose and poetry. Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Psalm, Songs, and Lamentations are entirely poetic in form. Most of bro, Job and portions of Ecclesiastes are poetic. Prose narratives in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, have substantial poetic sections. The prophetic books of Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah are composed completely in oracular po prose with the exceptions of the superscriptions or title verses. Here's another <clears throat> teaching about what oracular prose is. Oracular prose combines prose and poetry which is typical within prophetic literature. Other prophetic books contain large portions of poetry. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. In the Old Testament, only Leviticus, Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, and Malachi contain little or no poetry. The wisdom books are usually poetic. We call them wisdom books instead of poetic for other reasons. They have more principles of wisdom, to put it in general terms. Let's talk about wisdom literature. Hebrew wisdom combines several factors to constitute the definition of Old Testament biblical wisdom. Wisdom is practical or skillful living. It takes the powers of observation, the capacities of human intellect, and the application of knowledge and experience in everyday life, and states it as a principle in some form. Wisdom includes practical moral principles for behavior with a basic viewpoint rooted in the fear of the Lord. Wisdom literature acknowledges there is a moral order in the world. It sees the world with the view that God has a way for things to work within the world. Wisdom literature may be instructional or didactic or argumentative with reflection or speculation. Wisdom literature of the Old Testament includes Proverbs, Song of Songs, and the speculative books of Job and Ecclesiastes, and some wisdom psalms. Examples of wisdom psalms would be 1, 37, and 49. 
Portions of the poetic books use wisdom terminology and themes. Let's go back to poetry. Talk about poetry and wisdom in the ancient East in sort of general terms. We want to put them in the background of which they were written. Though Israel has a long literary tradition, so did nations like Egypt. Poetic writings from the 5th dynasty, 2350 BC, have been discovered. Of course, this is long before Abraham. Some Egyptian hymns are similar to biblical psalms. An Egyptian love song is similar to Song of Songs. There are also similarities in ancient Mesopotamia writings of Old Babylonian, 1900 to 1600 BC, and Sumerian literature. Poetic hymns and prayers. Now, Samaria, as you recall, is from the area that Abram was originally from. Sumeria. We have talked about the Gilgamesh epic, epic rather, and Enuma Elish, both of Babylon. The first containing a flood story, the other a creation epic. There are also parallels to biblical poetry and Canaanite literature, or Ugarit. 1400 to 1200 BC. So as Christians, it may be difficult for some of us to accept the fact that other people wrote hymns and wrote psalms and wrote poems in other nations even before the nation Israel, sometimes during. So what we're saying here, it was common in their culture. It's no different today if you live in the United States. Uh, Russia has its poetry. English or England, UK has its poetry. They have their hymns. They have their own literature. It was no different in the ancient world. Why would we think it'd be so special? You see, that's kind of the a skewed vision we get sometimes as Christians that the Bible is unique. It is unique, but it also has many common things with other nations and, and peoples, you see. I will point out some of those unique things about the Bible and biblical poetry and wisdom in a moment, but just understand that people lived just like we do today. We live in our country. People live in their countries. We just uh, understand that we have different cultures and different languages. That's fine. Uh, some believe in God more than others, just like they did in the ancient world. Let's move on. These parallels show a common West Semitic or literary heritage. So they basically come from a similar heritage. Same thing today, the English language comes from common, we have common roots with the Greek, with the, with the, um, the Latin, that type of thing, uh, European type of culture in the United States, as do other countries have their heritage also. No doubt that the Egyptians and Mesopotamian culture influenced the Hebrews. We see it in their cultural traditions their writings, and many of their customs. For example, Abraham, taking the handmaid Hagar to have an offspring, was a common custom attested in the marriage contracts of the Nutsi archives, which dates from the time of the Hurrian Empire of Mitanni from 1550 to 1350 BC. All this is saying is him taking on Hagar as a handmaid was not unusual in that part of the world in those days. Ugarit, was a seaport and city-state in the northern in northern Syria in the late Bronze Age. All the texts we have from there date to about 1550 to 1200 BC, long before David, who wrote so much poetry. In Ugaritic poetry, we see some of the same features we see in Hebrew poetry: chiasmus, synonymous, and synthetic parallelism. For example, there are also they also have superscriptions and subheadings in their poetry just like biblical poetry, you see. Let's look at one of the examples from uh, Egypt. Aten was one of the names of the sun gods, of the sun god of Egypt. Ra's the other one, if you didn't know that. But Aten, him, 
This is a hymn about him. The ships are sailing north and south as well, for every way is open at, their, at thy appearance. Thus fish in the river dart before thy face. That's talking about thy, in this case, is Aten. Thy rays are in the midst of the great sea. From Psalm 104, 25 and 26, there is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things, both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, which you formed, talking about the God of Israel now, to frolic there. So you see, Aten was seen as the God who did his thing with the fish and the ships, <coughs> and the sun, you might say, the in in the Egyptian world, as the God of Israel did what he did in the Hebrew world. Let's go back to wisdom now. Zeroing in more on the subject of biblical wisdom or Hebrew wisdom. Biblical wisdom, wisdom must be considered in an international context. The Bible attests to the wisdom of the Egyptians, 1 Kings 4.30, the Edomite, Jeremiah 49.7, and the Babylonians, Isaiah 47.10, Daniel 1.4. All this does, you go to those scriptures, it mentions that these people or nations had their own wisdom as well. Good teaching was highly valued in the ancient world. Much of the teaching was at home, but some children attended scribal schools to learn reading and writing. Teaching at home was a biblical principle as well. Parents teaching children. You see that within the Proverbs fairly clearly. Let's talk about Egypt. In Egypt, much of the teaching and instruction came from the courts of Pharaoh, where a future ruler would learn how to administer the kingdom. The wisdom literature of Egypt has many parallels to Hebrew literature. So what this is saying is the Pharaoh made sure his kids were educated because they might be running the kingdom someday. All right. Now let's look at some of the parallels between Egypt, Egyptian and Hebrew. This is from the teachings of Amenemope, an Egyptian sage. He wrote, guard yourself from robbing the poor, from being violent to the weak. Do not associate with the rash man nor approach him in conversation. From Proverbs 22, 22, and 24, notice the similarities. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. All this is saying is that there are similarities in thought and ideas when they wrote their poetry. Or in this case, it would be wisdom. This is wisdom, right? We're looking at the topic of wisdom. They viewed the world through the same human eyes. They saw some of the same things. They got some of the same ideas from their own experience. <clears throat> it's not much different today. People around the world know you have to train your children. Right? Egyptian writings include topics such as finding meaning and joy in life, social injustice, the problem of evil, the reality of pain and death. <clears throat> we see some of these same topics in Job and Ecclesiastes. Now we saw earlier there was a scripture reference to Edomite wisdom. Here's an example where we may have it in scripture, where we say Edomite wisdom may be in Job. Why? One of Job's friends, remember these three friends he had, is from the Edomite clan. His name was Eliphaz the Temanite. And you can trace that clan from Job 2.11 and also look in Genesis 36.1-11. The land of Uz was located in or near Edom. Lamentations 4.21. There's also Mesopotamian wisdom. It has similarities with Hebrew wisdom. Here's an example for you from the text called A Man and His God. This is Mesopotamian. Never has a sinless child been born to its mother. A sinless workman has not existed from of old. Now this is remarkable if you think about it. They recognized in their wisdom 
that man is basically a sinner. He's born a sinner. People sin. Now look at Job 15, 14 through 16. What is man that he can be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he can be righteous? Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. How much less one who is abominable and corrupt, a man who drinks injustice like water. So again, we see a recognition in Hebrew wisdom that people are born, or he who is born a woman, that he can be righteous. That everyone is born uh, unrighteous or sinner. In reading the world's literature, ancient or modern, we see people trying to cope with the problems and challenges of life. They have some of the same suffering, struggles, questions as Christians do. They also see injustice and evil in the world as we do. They are trying to navigate through the mess like we are. Many unbelievers use the same common sense derived from experience and observation as we do. In fact, the unbeliever often makes the same choices or gives the same advice as believers. But on many things, unbelievers have a tremendous handicap. They lack, they lack a divine perspective derived from wisdom and knowledge of God. They do not have the knowledge of the sovereignty of God or truth that gives greater insight into life. Most of all, they do not know God through his son, Jesus Christ. They do not have the internal power and guidance that God gives to his people. Wisdom from Scripture is the capital God gives us to spend in life. Remember that. You take wisdom seriously. You learn the Proverbs seriously. You take the principles and teaching of Scripture seriously because you make life decisions based upon them. So in the ancient world as of today, the one basic difference between the wisdom for the people of God and the world is that we believe in one God. They, the unbelieving world, believe in many gods and have many idols. Neither does the faithful believer pursue materialism or see some kind of God in everything, whether it be the stars or the earth or nature or one's being and so on. We know that man is basically a sinner needs to turn to God for a real, a real life. The unbeliever pursues his best from the sin nature. Remember that when you're dealing with unbelievers. When you are working within an unbeliever system. Uh, lust is often a motivator for the unbeliever. It may be greed. It may be sex. It may be power. They're trying to climb the ladder at the expense of stepping on people all the way up that ladder. You take promotion as from God when it's your turn, and you wait, and you don't step all over people. It doesn't mean you're not competitive, but at the same time, you don't take advantage. Let's talk about the literary character of Hebrew poetry. Now it starts to get difficult, and here's where you're going to see me probably mispronounce some terms or take two or three shots at them. I don't teach this every day, obviously. But I've learned these terms over the years. I've studied them. But I don't pronounce them. <laughs> Not out loud anyway. Though we go into more detail in particular books of scripture, we will mention a few points about it here. In English poetry, we often look for rhyme or rhythm of sound. In rhyme, we listen for words that sound similar at the end of a line or every other line, depending on the style. It's not quite the same in Hebrew poetry, but we do have rhythm of sound. The Hebrews used stress and unstress syllables or the repetition of sounds through alliteration or assonance. We'll talk about this later. This is to emphasize an idea, a theme, or to set a certain tone for the poem. But of course, unless you know Hebrew, you're not going to see this. It's difficult to determine even for those who are familiar with Hebrews. Now, with Hebrew, this is a specialized field, folks. This is very difficult. Uh, there's still a lot of questions and scholars debate different issues 
in this area as well. Let's talk about rhythm of sound. An acrostic poem, this is probably one of the simplest to explain. An acrostic poem, the first letters of consecutive lines follow the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, of course, for a word or phrase. The Old Testament has 13 complete alphabet acrostic poems in the Psalms, Proverbs, and Lamentations. This method was used as a mnemonic tool, tool or memory device in the ancient scribal schools. I put down here Psalm 112. After the opening line of praise the Lord, that's the first line here, we see the acrostic style. <clears throat> and I highlighted the first letter of these lines so you can see first letter, if you know any Hebrew at all, Aleph, Baith, Gimel, Daleth, He, Vav, Zayin, Chaith, Teith, Yoth. That's just the first five verses. You have, this is the alphabet order of the Hebrew. Now, if you try to do that in English, imagine how hard that would be. A first line would have to start with an A. A boy went down the street. Second line has to start with a B. Because a girl he wanted to meet. You see? Well, you can see how the next line's got to start with a C. Can he find her in time? Next one starts with a D. You see? Do not think he's going to find her. <laughs> now, you're, now you're out of rhythm, you see, but still it started with the next letter. So you can see how challenging it was. It took real skill to do this. Well, it doesn't get any easier. Let's talk about alliteration. The consonants of sounds at the beginning of words or syllables. Now, <clears throat> this one you can see, I think, even in the... Uh, you, can see, you can hear it and you can see it in the letters. You see this letter right here. It looks like a W, okay, with a dot over it. That's called a shin, or, or a shin in the Hebrew. It's pronounced like a sh, like in shy, sh. <clears throat> Sha'alu, shalom, Yerushalom. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You heard the alliteration there. Next category, assonance, uses the rhythm of sound using the correspondence of vowel sounds often at the ends of words. For example, the use of vowels. And this is hard to explain. It's hard to illustrate. So I'm just kind of kind of leave it at that. But you hear the rhythm when you read the Hebrew, when you listen for the vowels. You can see how difficult this would be. Let's go to Paranomasia. This is a little easier here. From Isaiah 5-7, I try to illustrate uh, by putting the key word up here. You have the word for justice. You can see the similarity with the next word for bloodshed. Mishpah. Mishpah. For righteousness. Sadiqah. Sa'akah. Now, you see the differences here as well, but they sound similar. This is called paranomasia, wordplay. We do that in English too. Here's that word that's always kind of tricky to pronounce, the fifth one, onomatopoeia. They sound like what they describe, but it's kind of fun because the word, when you pronounce it, it sounds like what it's describing. Oi! Now, we don't use that too much in the United States, oi, unless maybe you're a Jew. But that's the word for woe. Oh. They might say, oh. And we usually spell that O-H, right? Or oh, just an O. The word for thunder, ram. Ram. Here's one you might like. Galloping. Darot. Darot. That's a horse. Darot. I haven't got one up here that I like in particular. I, you'll hear me use it. It's a word for walking. Halak. A lock. You see somebody walking down the street. A lock, a lock, a lock. Maybe they got noisy shoes and they're, wa they're walking on uh, rocks or something. A lock, a lock. Onomatopoeia. 
ellipsis. We see this often. The omission of a word or words that would complete a given parallel. Now, often you'll find in the translations, they'll fill in with the pronoun or maybe the word that's missing. Here we see it filled in with a uh, pronoun. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. So we're talking about idols. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. Leave out that they have on, on line six. So we go, they have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell, hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throat. So this is sometimes one of the challenging things about ellipsis. What is the word that's missing? Inclusio. We see this quite a bit, or at least you've been with me in my studies. It's a form of repetition. What it does, it basically repeats key words or phrases at the beginning that's also at the end. All right, so the, uh, here's a good example. Psalm 118, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Verse 29, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. They're identical in this case. Sometimes they're similar. But the idea is it's kind of like an envelope. They call it an envelope or, or, or bookend type of thing where everything in between has some relationship to this first and second, uh, first and last line. Let's talk about rhythm of thought. Some of this you're familiar with if you study the Proverbs with me. Rhythm of thought. Rhythm of thought or sense is the balancing of ideas in a structured or systematic form. The primary vehicle for this in biblical poetry is parallelism. A great deal of skill and artistry went into this. What we would call a specialized field. Semantic parallelism based on word usage. Now this you've seen me use and teach. Use of synonyms. Psalm 24, 2, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And you see the synonyms here, founded and established, seas and rivers. They use similar terms, Psalm 1, 5. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners, that's similar with wicked, in the assembly of the righteous. Now there is some similarity here because you stand in judgment before the assembly of the righteous. The use of opposites. Psalm 37, 16, better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. That's rather obvious. There's a progressive parallelism. These are subcategories I haven't really talked about much in the past, but they exist. Based on logical sequence, use of cause and effect, delight yourself in the Lord, the effect, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Explanatory, Psalm 510b, because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. Notice the second line explains the first. Four is often an indicator here. You see that a lot in the Greek as well. Four, explanatory. Gar is what they call it in the Greek. Uh, here it explains the first line, for they have rebelled against you. That's why they're to be called to be cast out. They have an abundance of transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. That is the heart of their transgressions, is that they rebelled. We also see grammatical parallelism based on a choice of grammatical forms, parallel parts of speech. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Here you see the law of the Lord and the testimony of the Lord. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There we have the precepts and commandment, which is also very close to testimony and law. Rhythm of form. I told you this was technical. It's academic. But if you want to get into some of the twists and turns of meaning, sometimes it's necessary to get a good idea of what this is. Let's talk about meter. Two common methods is gauging Hebrew meter, uh, or of gauging Hebrew meter, or counting the stressed or accented syllables in lines of poetry, 
and counting syllables and the two lines of poetry. Now, first of all, you have to be able to read the meter, and that's not easy. Strophes, patterns or grouping of lines in larger units, difficult to do without refrains or repeated lines of text. Now, the people who get good at this are those who are the premier uh, scholars in books like the Proverbs. And you look at their commentaries, their technical ones, and you'll see them analyzing the meter and the strophes. And even if you had several years of Hebrew, like I have, you'll see things that uh, I've never seen that before because they get very technical. And they are with other technical scholars in studying these uh, poetry lines, uh, sometimes wisdom. And they'll see, they'll recognize this fairly obviously because they're reading it and they're studying it and now they're writing on it in detail. So more on Hebrew poetry. Like all poetry, Hebrew poetry is about life, love, marriage, birth, death, joy, suffering, and so on. Unique about Hebrew poetry is that it is centered on the God of the Bible, the Yahweh of the Old Testament, the Lord. Obviously, that makes it different and sets it apart from the rest of the world. Much poetry of Scripture is also musical in nature. It was meant to be sung or chanted. Now, even that is difficult to figure out. We don't have the tunes, and we don't have the rhythm of the chant. This aided in the moral transmission. It was sung during rituals, festivals, and all kinds of special occasions in the life of Israel. Many psalms indicate the style, the instruments, which musical director or composer to show us how important music and these psalms were in the life of God's people. So what we're saying here is that uh, Hebrew poetry, like we see especially in the psalms, often accompanied with music. Instruments, they were sung with choirs. They're written to choir directors. They were composed by someone who wrote music and it's indicated uh, within the psalm or the text itself. Poetry types, as with psalms, are throughout the scripture. Songs of wisdom, trust, laments, wedding, royal, messianic, and prophetic. I could also add praise, thanksgiving, that type of thing are but a sum of the variety of types of poetry. And we've studied this many times in the Psalms, as we look at the various Psalms. Some more on wisdom. We have addressed wisdom extensively in the Proverbs series, but let's look over some of those points and some new ones. Wisdom is often written from the perspective of training a younger or more inexperienced person about life. A father to son, mother to daughter, a wise old sage to those not so wise. The sage knows about life in many ways, the joys of youth, young marriage, but also the twists and turns of life, the ups and downs, dealing with the corrupt and unfairness of life, to how to live and deal with all kinds of people, the criminal, the honorable, the lazy, the hard worker, the poor, the wealthy, all kinds. Finally, how to relate all of these situations and people through the lenses of wisdom, how to make the best decisions when choosing is difficult, Wisdom gives discernment even to the wisest of us. No one ever has enough wisdom. Yet, as with all biblical wisdom, it begins with the fear of God. Recognizing that at every moment of your life, God is there and is ready to be loving and kind to all who will go his way. Biblical wisdom also considers the sovereignty of God. God is in control. 
He never is unaware of anything. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing gets out of his control. The original meaning of wisdom was some skill that one had in aptitude or ability like working with metal or wood, an artist, designer, sea navigator, or a craftsman. A wise person is a craftsman of life. He is skilled at life. God gave Solomon wisdom to rule a country, build a temple, 1 Kings 5, 9, to write Psalms and Proverbs, to make good judgments among the people, even about animals, 1 Kings 4, 29-34. Though like anyone, one has to stay right with God to get the most out of it, of which he failed at times, as Ecclesiastes attests to. This is talking about Solomon. When it gets down to it, biblical wisdom is the practical sense of how to live in the world where you can get the most out of life and be successful. By the way, that's the, that's the great value of wisdom. You want to get the most out of life? You want to make the best decisions in life? Uh, get a foundation early in life with biblical or Hebrew wisdom. Wisdom teaches how to have a satisfied life. Wisdom wins favor in the eyes of man and God. The wise person or sage was always an important and appreciated person in Israel when the nation was faithful. Now, of course, when they're unfaithful, they don't care to hear about wisdom. That's not uh, an uncommon experience today when you try to pass on wisdom to uh, people or children or someone not so wise. It's often ignored. Depends on situation in particular child or person. Along with the priest and prophet, he, that's the wise person, gave guidance to the community and often had a place in the king's court. A king can always use more wisdom. There are basically two different genres of wisdom in Scripture. There is didactic or practical wisdom like we see in the Proverbs. There are wise sayings on character, happiness, success, discernment, well-being, and many more. If you've studied the Proverbs with me, you know, you know what we're talking about. The other genre is more of a philosophical approach involved, which involved speculation. It is reflective. It raises questions and thinks about the meaning of life. We see this in Ecclesiastes and to some extent in Job. When people start asking questions and dealing with issues, they discuss it. They go back and forth on it. And this you see in Job. Of course, Ecclesiastes is sort of one-sided from uh, Solomon who's learned lessons in life, some hard, hard lessons. But to continue, it deals with the futility of life without God and the frantic search for happiness that even when found is fleeting. Remember that line. A lot of people are out there frantically searching for happiness. And when they think they found it, the new marriage, the new material thing, the new job, the new hobby, uh, even after a while it gets old. Both wisdoms, when, both wisdoms, when acquired early in life, gives the believer a tremendous advantage over all others in this world and sets him apart from the common man. A young man who is wise enough to acquire wisdom can avoid many of the common life errors that do damage or misdirect his life. You young people, listen to this one. He can do well by making good choices early. He does not get entangled with the wrong people or wrong woman. A young woman can make good choices in her relationships and endeavors as well. 
the wiser she is. She knows what people to avoid, what men to avoid, and so on. Because she's smart. She's developed wisdom. Uh, both young men and women have a real challenge today because the world has a tremendous grip on even believers. There are a variety of forms of wisdom, a parable, a precept, a riddle, a wise saying, an allegory as if wisdom were talking. We saw that in Proverbs 8 and 9 in our study. Let's talk about the path of wisdom. According to biblical wisdom, there are only two paths, the path of life and the path of death. This is the most, the most stark contrast. Other contrasting paths, path of wisdom or the foolish, a path of the righteous or the sinner, the faithful or unfaithful. This principle overlaps in the New Testament in Jesus' words of the narrow gate and the wide gate. Wisdom is not just about knowledge, but also about character and behavior. Remember that. When it talks about Hebrew or biblical wisdom, it definitely has an effect upon your character and what you do. Wisdom is a lifestyle. Did you hear that? It's a lifestyle, a way of life. Another thing to keep in mind is that in the Old Testament, wisdom is rooted in the law of Moses. Now, this is something I have to often point out because when we talk about the Proverbs, remember, they're living under the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, the fundamental teachings of how to live as God's people. Wisdom shows how to live best according to God's will. And of course, remember, under the Mosaic Law, I'm going to elaborate here for a moment. Under the Mosaic Law, if you're obedient, you're blessed. If you're disobedient, you're cursed. That's the basic principle. Now, what about when it comes to making decisions? Well, you, have, you may have several decisions that are within the moral boundaries. All right. Uh, we have decisions today we have to make. Uh, a young man decide whether they want to go to college or technical school or, or just go out and get a job, maybe work for someone they know, maybe do it a while or join the military or civil service, some, something else. Well, which way do they go? Well, none of them are immoral. None of them violate God's basic will. But there's some teaching that's been going around for years that, well, God has a specific, perfect place for you. Well, I'm not going to say that's not true. But what I'm saying is we don't know which one that is. And now people are out searching for these places, going from job to job. And unfortunately, some do it with people as well, their relationships. So now that presents a real problem. I think the best way to put this is to say some choices are better than others. Yes, one may be best. So you choose the best choice with the information you have. This is how we stay within the boundaries of God's will, you might put it that way. But often people, I think, get into trouble always looking for some specific spot special, pinpoint thing they should do. I mean, when you choose which socks to wear, which outfit to wear in the morning, does God have a particular outfit for you to use? Well, now, there could be some consideration there. Uh, a woman wants to wear something modest, right? A man would want to wear anything too tacky, would he? or disrespectful, or have something written on his shirt that's uh, blasphemous or, or gross or sinful, that type of thing, you see. 
So that, but that's extreme, right? But really, I don't think God's concerned about the pair of socks you wear or the kind of shoes you wear or that type of thing. But uh, when it comes to bigger decisions, the same way you make the best decision according to the information you have and wisdom. And if you don't have the right information or enough information, you wait. It's really pretty simple. That doesn't put you doing strange things like casting lots or setting out a fleece, that type of thing. Uh, that doesn't work today. We're not working under that Old Testament system. We're not casting lots as they did up until the time of Christ, by the way. Um, in fact, uh, the apostles do it as well. But we're not doing that today. We find God's guidance in his word and circumstances, making the best choice. Let's continue on our next paragraph. Opposite to the wise is the foolish. Many terms and levels are used for this person. We see that especially in the Proverbs. He is the naive, the stupid, the brainless, unlearned, shameless, evil, and godless. These are many terms for those who are on the side of a fool. He is proud, a scoffer, irrational, a babbler. He can't keep his mouth shut. He boasts, a persecutor of the righteous, self-destructive, destroys others, even criminal. He rejects wisdom, instruction, correction, and is insolent and irreverent before God. This too carries over into the New Testament where there is godly wisdom or earthly demonic wisdom. We see this in James where godly wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and so on. James 3, 13-17. Uh, folks, wisdom is very important in life. Um, a good deal of scripture is wisdom. We talk about biblical principles and truths. That also includes wisdom. But learn, the reason I do this lesson as well as others in regards to Proverbs, learn what real wisdom is. Learn how it's defined. Um, it's not always a promise. Often wisdom is not a promise. It's a general truth about life. And we talked about that a lot in our Proverbs and similar teachings. Next paragraph, God is a God of wisdom. Job 12, 13. He chose to share that wisdom with his creatures. Those of us who choose to learn and live by that wisdom live in accordance to God's will and draw closer to him in our walk with him. This wisdom brings blessing and understanding to life. With that wisdom, we set our priorities and manage our life as God would have us. Wisdom is also developing and deepening that fear of the Lord on which wisdom is founded and begins. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus Christ is to the believer wisdom from God. You know Christ? You know his mind? You have wisdom from God. Wisdom keeps you from trouble, and if you do get into trouble, wisdom helps you get out of it. Wisdom gives you discernment to make the best choices. When I'm doing this particular lesson, it's during the time of the uh, virus problem, which has been going on now for a while. But people have to change their choices. Tough choices. Some very tough choices. Um, it's an opportune time. To utilize wisdom that you've accumulated over years of study of scripture. Now, if you're a new believer, well, you're going to learn how important it is to depend upon the Lord and how important it is to learn his word so you can make good choices.
A key point in the learning and developing of wisdom is that it is to each individual a choice. Wisdom is available. One has to avail himself to it. So we choose to be wise or not. We choose to learn wisdom or not. The way of wisdom is life and satisfaction with life. The way of the fool is misery with no meaning to life, ending in death. As we ready ourselves to move into the wisdom books of Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in our next lessons, we should keep in mind these principles. Old Testament wisdom is rooted in the Mosaic law. In the law, there remains the blessing for obedience, cursing for disobedience, reward for good behavior, and punishment for bad behavior. So remember that as you read these wisdom books, particular books like Proverbs or or Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, or uh, not Song of Solomon, uh, Psalms, uh, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, we should keep these principles in mind. We don't know the exact date of, uh, date of Job, but we should consider that being under the Mosaic Law as well. Final paragraph, wisdom helps us regulate our life. Wisdom helps guide and direct us to get the most out of life. The writings of the wisdom cover a variety of topics, giving us insight to life, relationships, various circumstances, dealing with various types of people, and many other things, but most of all, how to live our best before God and get the most out of life. And who wouldn't want that? Now, let me just add a per couple of personal comments here. I don't understand. I really don't understand why Christians don't want to get wisdom. Now, it's essential if you want to make the best choices. Now, I understand young people having struggling with it. But if parents te teach their children wisdom, uh, do you as a parent sit down and go through the Proverbs with your children? Why not? It's wisdom from God for you to develop a godly child. Now, like I said earlier, a few minutes ago, it's a choice. They still have to choose to accept it. They have to choose to apply it. Uh, they have to choose to listen, to sit still. Well, what tremendous advantages your children will have if you teach them wisdom. And what tremendous advantages you will have. I don't care how old you are. We find in the Proverbs, it even talks about people who think they're wise can learn wisdom. And that's true. There's always more to learn. Can never get enough wisdom from Scripture. Well, we'll leave it there. And that'll prepare us for our next books that are uh, not only contain lots of wisdom, but contain poetry. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word today. There's many challenges in the sense that this is rather academic, but at the same time, it gives us insight and preparation to better understand your word. Challenge us with the things we've heard today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.